Hi folks, my name is Pat Gage with uh, the Block G Group. And in this video here, this is a recording of a commercial real estate investing mastermind we hold bi-weekly. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. And at the end, we'll show you how to join and join in with us on these calls. And again, like I said, they're bi-weekly. Uh, so please join us and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Everybody's time. Let me make sure everything's set up here. And all right, well, I'm going to do that. Let's uh, go ahead and welcome everybody uh, to the Commercial Mastermind. Thank you very much for joining us on, in some areas, a cold evening. But hopefully the topic we're going to talk about tonight is going to warm you up. I've got uh, Derek Struggs on here tonight. And I'm trying to think when we first met, Derek, it's been it's been a few years, I think. We've yeah, I mean, actually, you, you were known as the business credit expert. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Way back when, right? Um, and Derek and I kind of hang in the same circle. We've got a couple couple good friends that are uh, mutual, and uh, I've always stayed in touch with Derek and, and, and watched his videos as of late um, about uh, his apartment investing. And, you know, and I said, you know what, I, I need to have a, a person of this on here. Uh, to give us, give us, you know, that, you know, that mastermind link, right? That how do you do things? And, and he, and I pulled out some of the stuff that he talks about and I just want, I'm not going to give him, this is the only intro I'll do. I'll let him do it from here, but that's the reason he's here. He has apartments. He owns apartments. He does houses as well. And this is the guy that's, that is, is really doing it. And I think he can share a lot of knowledge with everybody on the call about what he's done, what he's doing. Uh, you know, and, and maybe help us out a little bit. Help, you know, some of you have some troubles. And he talks about his, you know, his uh, uh, setting tenant expectations, which I, I'm kind of excited about hear about that. Like, what, what is what is that? I mean, you can actually do that, uh, and, and but he can, you can. So uh, without that, without anything else, I think I'm all set here on my side. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Derek, and you go ahead and give us a 30-second inter introduction. And then I've got a, I'll just, we'll do a question and answer, and then, Towards the end, um, we'll uh, let people uh, ask questions as well. So hang on to your questions if I haven't asked them, uh, and we'll have plenty of time for that. So, Derek, it's all you, sir. Okay. Well, just a uh, brief background on who I am. Um, I've been doing real estate since really 1996. Um, started off in the mortgage business. Uh, 1996, I worked for a mortgage company um, from 96 to probably 99 and one of my me and a good friend of ours we started our own company in 2000 in 1999 from 1999 till the market crashed in 2007 2008 we ran a very successful mortgage company we probably closed about 100 mortgages a month uh so we did pretty good market changed drastically in 2000 2007 eight we didn't really have an alternative plan but at the time what was unique about it was that the international investors had decided to come into the U.S. So we started working with people all around the country that wanted to buy uh, single family homes, but some of them wanted to buy, you know, larger units, which would be multi-units. And that's basically how I really got started into the multi-family business. It was basically out of necessity because a lot of my investors, the single families wasn't big enough for them and they wanted multiple um, situations. It was scalable, a lot easier to do a 10 unit building or 20 unit building than do 10 single family homes. Uh, so that's how basically we started in the business. And of course, through trial and error, we made a lot of mistakes. And that's why I could tell you what to do and what not to do. Uh, the, best, the best thing I will tell you is when you first get started is whatever you think you need in capital, you're probably going to need a little more because everything costs more. You know, it's, it's just per door. So, you know, a single family, everything is, com is compartmentalized into this one single family. But you got 10 unit, 20 unit, 30 unit, you just got to extrapolate everything based on the amount of doors you have and everything costs more money, it's actually easier to manage because it's all under one umbrella as opposed to doing a scatter site development. So if you got 10 single family, they're typically not all in one area. They're all scattered around. Whereas a 10 or 20 unit building, it's all, situated, it's all in one situation. So you can compartmentalize and you can keep all your problems into one little area. Uh, and then one of the questions that um, um, Pat had asked about, how do you create expectations? Well, I think, you know, your goal is always to be the best property in the area. So it doesn't have to be the best area. 
but you want to be the best property in the area. So from landscaping to the inner workings of it, so you want to keep the interior clean, keep all that stuff. That's one of the things I've learned about trying to create expectations. Uh, your tenants, baby, they mirror who you are. If you create expectations, then they follow. What happens is, I found out that a lot of our uh, apartment owners, they really don't create no expectations. They don't put any pressure on them. They don't tell them. So I try to have a meeting, almost a come to Jesus meeting when they first move in. You can't pay, you can't stay. These are my rules. And then from that point, we go from there. So that's just a brief overview. You know, over from 96 to now, me and my partner, we probably flipped maybe upwards of 200 houses. That's single families. We work from buy, fix, and flip to investors where they would buy and create a cash flow. We had a property management company where we managed about 400 houses. Uh, and then we also did the ones where we actually buy, fixed, and flip to first time home buyer. It broke it. You know, they, they're just two different animals uh, as far as what you're trying to accomplish, but it, it's the same situation. You know, you got a profit margin you're trying to make, whether it's a buy, fix, and flip to an investor or buy, fix, and flip to a first time buyer. Gotcha. So when we figured gotcha. out, it was a lot more scalable and it was a lot easier for us to get to 50 units, 100 units by doing apartments as opposed to doing single families. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to ask you. So, so the, the realization that you've had you know, hundreds of homes, now all of a sudden you've got all those in one spot. That's that's the reason why multifamily was attractive to you, right? Is the fact that you can do it right there in one area, have one maintenance guy on, on site. Is that a pretty good estimation? You're exactly correct, Pat. In that situation, everything is all is in that one area. Uh, now, if it's a problem, everything is in that one area. But the good thing about it is you can identify most of your problems. You typically have one boiler that's going to control the situation. So if you fix that, you have that taken care of. You, uh, your maintenance guy can hopefully, if it's anything 20 and above, you have an on-site maintenance guy. So the fact that somebody can call and get the repairs taken care of. The biggest thing I found out in, as far as in multifamilies is you have to be quick to um, correct whatever issue. Because in a small knit community, your word travel fast. You either a good landlord or bad landlord. He never fixes anything. Well, that spread real fast. Or, hey, you can depend on him. He does exactly what he says he's going to do. Those, it seems like it's the same situation, but by not being retro, by not being ready to make decisions and fixing stuff quickly, it can change the dynamics of your building in 30, 60, 90 days just by four or five tenants not complaining, saying things not there. Because if you have laundry, they're congregating in the laundry room. When they leave, is somebody probably know somebody else. So always, if you can create a good working relationship and making sure you create the expectations by, hey, your rules are, you pay me by the purse, my rules to make sure that the fact is you have a safe and a nice place to live. And if something went wrong, we'll make sure we get it fixed, fixed expeditiously. You are unpacking so many nuggets of wisdom. I'm trying mm -hmm. to keep up with the, with the notes here. Okay, let's go back. Okay. Uh, obviously, th this is great information. So, obviously, the the tenant expectations are are basic. What you said, you know, I expect you to pay. Uh, you know, you expect me to fix things. So that is great. Now, you said something about do you do a a meeting with this? How, I guess how do you do that? Do you do this when you sign the lease, or is this a? Yeah, a I try to make sure that me personally, I try to on like on units when they first get started, I try to meet them initially, because what I want to do is I never want to have any ambiguity. I want them to understand exactly what we're getting to it's a relationship people okay. don't realize that tenant owner is a relationship so i explained to i said my job is to give you the best place where you've been at now i can't control if something happens outside the owner but as far as repairs the area the, the maintenance area the common areas the exterior the snow removal i make sure all that get taken care of now those are going to be what's my response your responsibility is make sure that on the first, no matter what, you have to pay. Mother gets sick, you lose your job, you need to pay on that particular situation because the fact is, it doesn't change the fact that you're still going to have to have a place to stay. Now, of course, there's always exceptions to every rule. But what I try to do is, let me take the exceptions out and let you know that your rent is due on the first, not the second, not the third, not the fourth. And what happens is, once you get them to buy into the fact that we're a team, and I need you to make sure you make your rent payment because a portion of that payment helps me do repair, helps me pay my taxes, helps me do all these different situations. It's not like I'm some rich landlord. If I don't receive your rent, uh, then the fact that it's a possibility I can't do anything. And I explained to him, I said, hey, look, even though it may be 20 units here, 
if we're not at least collecting from 16 people, I'm not making a profit. Gotcha. I think, I think you unravel something really good there as far as, you know, cause I, I've been in a situation as well. I'm not going to pay you until you fix this. Well, it, it's, it's like the, the cat's tail, right? Well, if you don't pay me, I can't get it fixed kind of a thing. And you kind of set that expectation right off the bat. Hey, listen, this is how it is. You know, I'm, I'm going to get these things done as soon as I humanly can, but you need to pay by the first, right? So that's sex the expectation. And then secondly, we'll get these uh, work orders done as fast as we can. I, I think that's a great way to do it, Derek, because I think a lot of people have gotten into that. I know I have when I was in my single family days. Well, okay, yeah, you just, you know, pay me tomorrow, you know, I'll get it fixed. And, and all of a sudden the urgency comes on the you getting stuff fixed, you know, and then you, again, a negotiation then with your handyman, then it just, it just goes, rolls down the street, right? Instead of saying, okay, listen, it's due on the first, the work orders will get done within whatever you promise them, and, but you have to pay. And I love that pay, no stay. I think that's great. And I think if people would do that. You'd have a lot less headaches, I believe. And I appreciate you saying that. That's awesome. And then what happens is from that point, you'll be surprised. They start buying into the situation because when something happens and you actually do exactly what you say you're going to do in a timely fashion, it eliminates that conversation. Okay, ma'am, you had these repairs. I did exactly what I said. So the fact is, irregardless of the fact that you missed your day at work or whatever it is, you know, mother got sick, I still need to figure out a situation. So my goal is to always create an open line of communication. And that's very important because what happens is once you cut the communication, now you become enemies, right? They, they, you did big bad landlord, and then now I'm mad at you. So I, my whole goal is always create an open line of communication, man. Okay, look, if you can't pay everything on the on the situation, you know, it's thirty days in a month. I only have to get paid one time. So the fact that you, you knew that the rent was due at the beginning of the month, so if you can't pay everything, what can you pay today? Yeah, that's it. Great. It creates uh, us instead of you versus me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I was just going to say. I mean, that, especially when you do it at, at the forefront of the relationship, there is no surprises. Hey, listen, right. you know, hey, I'm going to give you this. You're going to give me that. I think that, that that's great. So now when you're looking One of the things that I will add to this, one of the things that you'll find out that actually eliminates a lot of problems. When tenants move in, you should do a walkthrough with your tenants when they move in. Okay. And what happens is, any issue they have, it eliminates that conversation because I'm cutting on the water, I'm flushing the toilet, I'm closing the doors, I'm opening the windows. At that point in time, we have a checklist to go through all these situations. So two or three days down the line or a week down the line, they can't say, well, I moved in and I'm starting to find all these issues. So, man, when we came through, we double checked. You signed your you, you, you signed your new move-in list. And then also give them a five-day grace period saying, hey, look, if you find anything in the first five to seven days, please let me know. And I also give them a benefit of doubt. If anything is wrong that we don't correct in those five to seven days, that portion of your rent, I will take off. So now it's a win-win situation for them because now they're saying, okay, hey, look, this guy going to do what he said, or he's going to lose money. So now I make sure that my maintenance guys are extremely efficient as far as getting over there, getting everything rectified. Now, there's been times where I had to pay that little portion because something couldn't get fixed or whatever it was. But the, what happens is it creates a buy-in to them that this landlord is different. That's the only thing I'm trying to do is create an expectation that the fact that we want you to have a safe, affordable, and place where you feel comfortable. If you create that, what happens is now you create a referral base that goes down. Uh, one of the questions you have, you don't ask about my bets and bash or whatever it is, I really haven't had to do a lot of marketing. The VA come to me now because the word of mouth is the fact that these guys do exactly what they say. So it's a waiting list of seven, 800 displaced veterans. I don't have to work that hard. They come and they call me now because the fact that they know I'm going to create a safe, affordable, and uh, economical place for their best to live. And the fact is I actually care. Gotcha. And that, that, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great, uh, let's say, referral list, right? I mean, people, people, okay, I buy this building. How am I going to get to filled? It seems like if you've built, again, in your systems and your processes that says, okay, this is how we're going to do business. I love that walking through with a checklist and they can check it off. I think I think that's I think it's awesome. It's always going to be some, because what happens is it's always a disconnect from you, your maintenance guy, and your tenant, right? Sure. Your maintenance guy saying everything is done. The tenant is saying not. Nah. Well, okay, well, no problem. It may not be me, but somebody attached to my situation before they move in 
before the lease is signed, you have to do this walkthrough. Yep. That way it eliminates that conversation that things didn't get done. Well, ma'am, on this date, you signed it. Did you not sign it? Well, okay, well, ma'am, this it's power in the written word. It's, you know, like I say, documentation yeah. is conversation, it's right? The triangle of communication. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And the other thing is, too, is, you know, my done may be a little bit different than your done Indeed. or Kate's done. You know what I'm saying? So if you don't have that definition of, hey, when I push this thing down, the water should flow in the toilet and flush, that is done. Not, well, I got to jiggle it and I got to open the bowl. And, <laughs> you know, and I've had that. I'm like, and I sit there and go, really? Are we, are we really you know, two grown people talk, but again, that, that's, again, it's setting those expectations. Hey, listen, yeah. this is what's happening, you know, yeah. right across the board. Go ahead, Kay. Derek, you said something about um, the veterans. How do you get uh, started getting them into your housing? That was a question. Well, I'm gonna give you, that's that's well, a good question. That, that's, that, that's, that's, there's like nine different agencies, right, that really do it. You got Southwest Solutions, you got Volunteers of America. You got Hands. That's that's uh, Housing Against uh, Homeless Veterans. You got uh, Disability Network. Those are four main ones that you can start with. One of the best ones they got one. They Volunteers of America. Basically, they have a program where, and it's kind of unique in the sense that a lot of your veterans are displaced for multiple different reasons. And everybody always thinks the fact is you know, that you're a bad person because you're displaced. You'd be surprised at just the fact is that they had. Uh, different family issues, whatever it is, but those are some of the best things because now they, once you let them into your place, now, okay, hey, look, you're different. You understand the situation. Uh, so if you go to Volunteers of America, Vets, in each area you got, so you're in Farmington, they may have, I think they got one in Lansing. The one I deal with is on Milwaukee. Uh, and they all intertwine, intertwine together. So mm -hmm. as soon as you go and you have a situation, now it's two different parts of it. You have the BASH program, which is that's the Veteran Assistance Supportive Housing. That's similar to the HUD Section 8. So let's say RPI. RPI will be your location for anything to deal with BASH. So they're the ones that do all the BASH inspections. So that, that pool of money, instead of it coming from HUD, it comes from the VA. VET. There's no difference. It's the exact same inspection you would get if you had a Section 8 tenant. The same people from RPI that do the Section 8 tenants, they do the same thing for BASH or whatever it is. But they're the local area that does, that supplies you all your BASH tenants or whatever it is. So any inspection you have is going to go through BASH. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Let me, let me, let me. Let me, me through RPI. RPI. Let, let me make sure we got this. So you got, you said HANS is one of the organizations. H -A -N Veterans of America. Volunteers of America. Volunteers of America. You also had Disability Network. Disability Network. Okay. And, and then Southwest Solutions. And then Southwest Solution. Solution. Now, are, are these just in Michigan or are these nationwide? Nationwide. Okay. Nationwide. Every city got some situation like that. Because I work with another gentleman that's in Florida. Well, I basically flew down there and I went out and I took time and I helped him set the network up. I found the, the like kind people in those areas or whatever it is. Okay. And what was unique okay. was I contacted the people here and they gave me contacts for people in that area. Okay, awesome. So now, are, are these are, they do apartments as well as single family, like section They do apartments, they do houses, everything. Okay. They, you know, and then what happens is their goal sometimes when you get into houses, they want to transition them because, you know, of course, they got that two, two, they got the, the veteran zero down. They want to transition when they're in the housing oh. into buying the house, right? Because it's actually cheaper for them most time to end up buying the house or whatever it is. So they got programs for that. And what's so unique about it is that you know, a lot of them, when I say they displaced or whatever it is, they're living in hotels or different situations like that. They typically fund them with a house full of furniture, bedding, you know, wow. okay. it's, it's the most unique situation. So, so they can also, get a real good, safe place to live and, and obviously get back on their feet. So, I guess a question for you is mm -hmm. how, you know, when you first started out, how did you initially? How, do you, how would one, if let, let's say if I have a, a building, how would I approach these as a new landlord? How would I approach these people? You know, calling this, is there some kind of referral, a list that they got? I got really no referral. Basically, uh, what I do, uh, Pat, once I finish, I email you a list of the contacts I have. And then you can just call them. They're looking for housing. They're looking for how apartments. Okay. They always have more demand than they do units. If I got a 20-unit building, I fill it up, but it's another 480 that's waiting. 
Gotcha. Okay. Almost like a section eight. I, I used to. Use yeah. So always a waiting list of people. So he, okay. my twenty is just a drop in the bucket. So I guess I guess are you focusing on the veterans because that that's that's the niche that you found? Uh, well, no. I, okay. Section? What I found out was this is okay. And I'm quite sure, okay. Uh, I don't know what your unit mix was. You know, most people want their unit mix to be one bedroom, two bedrooms, correct? Well, what I figured out was that with my badge program, my ideal tenant is a single male, 55 years old, uh, with no kid. They only need a one bedroom. They only need a one bedroom unit, right? Yeah. Guess the thing. The thing is this: the only way you make money in this business is you can't have a lot of churn, right? Mm -hmm. My 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 rate of of move out turnover was maybe five percent every 20, 12, 24 months or whatever it is. So what happens is is two things. One, this 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 I can't say this. I probably can't say it in the right way. But a single man, fifty five years old, guess what? He's not tearing your place up. Now section eight, that same single. That same one bedroom, you got two kids in there. Look at the difference in the amount of repairs and situations you have. Yeah, just wear and tear and maintenance. Absolutely. Wear and tear. You're right. So yeah. that's why I figured out that we wanted to target that into situation because first of all, I had low uh activity because most of them are single men, 55 and up. So it's not a lot of activity, first of all. Second of all, my maintenance repairs on cost are not that a single male is not complaining as much as a as, as a family or a wife with I mean a woman with two kids because in fact a woman be more attentive to detail. The vet is just happy he got a place. Yeah, or sometimes so they probably just fix it himself and not even worry. That's it. They, they that's what I was gonna I say. Had, They'll just fix it themselves. They say, hey, look, this happened. Hey, I took care of it. Hey, no, we worry about taking off the rent or whatever it is because the fact is they, they so it's a different situation. So my maintenance cost goes down. See, this business is all about, you know, this guy told me something a long time ago. You know, do, you got to look at vanity over sanity, right? And what I mean by vanity over sanity is this. Vanity is I got a 20-unit build, building. Sanity is the fact is I got 100% collecting and I'm making 20% off this building. So which one do you want? I, I prefer the sanity portion of it because the fact is it's not how many units. Am I profitable in this particular building? And that's how I look at it from that standpoint. People always, you know, I'd rather have 20 units and they're 100% occupied and I'm collecting from 95 to 100% and then I got a low turnover than to have 60, 70 units. But the fact is I got a 20% vacancy and I'm only collecting 70%. Now, the total amount of cash flow is a lot more on that 70 units, but the amount of money I can spend is not that I'm doing a current situation. So in my business, I always believe in that vanity, I mean, the sanity over vanity. Where can I create a situation where I had a most efficient unit where it's paying me and the fact is that I, that I can, in turn, invest back into my building, pay my building off, and also be able to do the repairs I need to do. Because what happens is a building that's running at 60, 70% occupied, all I'm doing is turning the money. It's coming in, and then I'm, I'm making excuses on why I can't do stuff. In reality, it's like I just can't really afford it. Because if you got a if you got a mortgage, taxes, insurance, maintenance, whatever it is, it's gonna run you about seventy five percent. That twenty five percent is what's left over. So your goal is if you run the building, you have to figure out how can I become efficient to get to a hundred percent and collect ninety percent of it. So I identified the ideal tenant, which is a single male, fifty and up, low turnover, because the ROI only 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 comes in effect. If I get that tenant to stand there two, three, four years, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm doing a lot of turnover, the fact is every time I turn over, it's going to be a 30, 60 day window before I can put somebody in there. But if I got a tenant to stand three or four years, I'm starting to get a return on my investment. Exactly. And, I, yeah. and a lot a lot of times, it, a lot of people, and I'm glad you brought that up. I don't think they, 
lot of people talk about that, that, that the relationship part of building that and seeing that, and, oh, they just want to get it, you know, 40 units, 100 units, whatever. But yeah, it's that relationship you're building so these people stay with you long term so then you can get the generational wealth. So you're not every month putting five, six thousand dollars into turning these properties. Mm -hmm. Every know. tenant, every time you lose a tenant, it's a term, it's a cost to turn and then you have that lost rent. I mean, on average, it's going to be 36 days, depending on the condition of the unit, whatever it is. Well, that one helps you lose money. So my goal is, what do I need to do to keep this person in here for three to four years? So we, you know, Thanksgiving, we create a nice Thanksgiving dinner for them. We supply dinners for them. Christmas, we give them a nice Christmas bonus. So, you know, you know, most of their rent is already paid. We give them a $100 gift card for Christmas. So what happens is now they become like family. They don't want to leave. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, so that, the, it, was a, it was, you know, like I say, success is a planned event, right? So a, our goal it. is to make <laughs> sure it. that we put a situation together where we create the most advantageous situation, you know, with the tenant in mind. You know, that's what we figured out because without tenants, without good paying tenants, our business is, is, is irrelevant. So we try to figure out, you know, we reverse engineer, how do we find the right tenant for this particular building? That's gonna pay us with the least amount of headache. Gotcha. So now, when you're, when, you're, when you're looking for buildings, do you look for a specific unit mix? It, w w give me an idea. 20 to 40, 20 40, right? 40 units. 20 40 units. That's our ideal situation. Uh, preferably all one bedrooms. Oh, okay. So you go all. So you you kind of brush against conventional wisdom. Oh, I get to have a, a good unit. Make. But again, it goes back to you already know your tenant, right? You already know that ideal tenant. So you want all single one bedrooms because your ideal tenant is this 55 year old gentleman or lady that done it. So you're kind of backing into that, which is, which is unique because a lot of people don't do that. They just, okay, the area is this or that, or I wanted a good unit mix. That's great that you know your, your target market and you go and look for a property that meets that because like you said, your the supply is way over what you could, you could, uh, you know, your demand, I should say, is way over your supply. Yeah, so that's what we did. We just reverse engineer. Okay, who do we have? Who do we want as a tenant? And what's the ideal apartment? Okay, instead of trying to find what we competing against the one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, because the unique part about it is having a family with kids in there with all bets. It's, it's a contradiction, right? Because gotcha. my buildings are quiet, pretty much no noise through there. Really, every now and then. You know, so what happens is if you got kids, they're going to be a certain amount of activity, a certain amount of noise. So now it creates a, a conflict. So with our business, we eliminate that conflict by only putting 55 and up. Derek, have you done anything where you're um, renting out bedrooms? Like you have a five or six bedroom property? Um, I'm actually working on that right now. I actually got a house, a six bedroom where mm -hmm. the volunteers, they got programs where some of the guys don't qualify for the $600 but they will qualify for $400 so they can pay $100 a week. Right. And you need a bedroom or whatever it is. So we're actually processing that right now. And the vets will pay for that. They help furnish the, the place for you, whatever it is. The only negative part of that, you just responsible for all the utilities in the particular building. That's it. But you can and prorate exactly. it to each room for the most part. Yeah. So what I do is I basically, if I got six rooms, I'm paying 400 to 450, you know, so that's going to bring $2,400. Yep. It's a lot more than that. So let's say I allocate six hundred dollars for utilities. That's that's what I'm working on right now that uh I twitched over to when my ten thirty one failed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, then here's my uh backup plan. As soon as I've got that funding, I've got five bedroom building that you know, I'm not getting rented out to your family. Um and I was looking since I got into real estate on getting the veterans in because they have the um, government paycheck behind them. I mean, so, the majority of them all got some kind of social security, disability. Yeah, some kind guaranteed of rent. Most so, of them average in between 900 to $2,500 in rent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and I mean income. So fact, like you said, about, they're quiet. They don't trash your property. And if something minor goes wrong, they're good at fixing it and not calling you to do something that you could have done if you just thought about it. The unique part about it, I run a construction company. That's my side business. So a lot of the guys, they're, you know, they're retiree, right? So they're, you know, 
they got a unique skill set. So a lot of them work for me too as well. So, and I'm not talking about where they're going out doing that, but they may put some towel in, they may want to do a little cleanup because most of them retired, right? So, you know, sitting in the house all day that, you know, for some reason that just doesn't work good for them. So they look up for activities. So now I create more of a situation where they like, okay, look, you know, hey, you got anything for me? They may work quite a week. They may come work with me. That's awesome. That's awesome. But what happens is now it becomes a family unit. Now it, I don't have to do a lot because now they're keeping the main, they're keeping the grounds clean. They see stuff sitting outside and I'm taking care of them. Now we become more of a family situation. So they're actually keeping the stuff on our side. A lot and then of they're doing nobody, their own kind of like neighborhood watch and yeah. They it's tell just me, a benefit all the way around. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. what uh, Pat, just a quick question. Are we holding our questions until the end, or are we chiming in as the questions arrive? I just wanted to be clear on the process, because I, I thought I heard the end, but but I hear other questions getting poked at Derek, and I just want to I want to get my questions in, but I thought I wanted to follow and respect the process. You know, I had a question, too. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, that, 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 that's cool. We, we can we can take the questions. I know I said at the, uh, at the beginning to do that, but it, this is more interactive than than I than is than I'm used to. So that's okay. And that's great. So why don't you go ahead uh, saying if you have your question, Vernon, I'll get to you. Okay, so saying why don't you get to your and the only reason is he's on the second level and you're in the third level, Vern. So go ahead and ask your question. All right, thank you. Um, Derek, so a question about, um, so you're, you're able to go after a specific target, 55 and up males, right? How do you advertise it that way? And um, how do you deal with um, discrimination and stuff? You know, they might be saying, well, yeah, you're discriminating against me. I have a kid, I have a family. <laughs> well, no, what happens is this. I, I don't really openly advertise my building. Mm. See, so what happens is if you openly advertise, it's different. I don't openly advertise. So people don't know I got vacancies or don't have vacancies. So at that point in time, I'm not discriminating. When people call me, I say, I just don't have any available vacancies. That's true. So, you know, it's different if I had a sign out and I'm doing open vacancies. But in my situation, I know my target market when I get started. When I first did my first building, we put a sign out and we did have those issues. But we actually called the city of Detroit and they said, we actually put a sign saying the fact that we only accept 55 and up. And at that point in time, so in our front, on our monitor, we had it on there, the fact that this is a senior 55 and up building, we never had any more issues. Gotcha. So okay. as long as you disclose it ahead of time, yeah. uh, you disclose it ahead of time, it's never a problem. Now, uh, exactly. all our vets 55 and up, no, but some of, most of them in that 50 and up. You see, you see what I'm coming from? So if you're 49 or 50 and you're a vet, we're not gonna turn it down because they come from the same allocation or whatever it is. It's a retired person that's basically looking or was displaced or whatever it is, and they need to be rehoused. Gotcha. So we never had a problem with, we never had any discrimination, whatever it is, but on our building now, we never openly advertise to anybody. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Vern, uh, you can go with your question, sir. Now, okay. I'm going to give you a secret just for your information. <laughs> like if you, when, when what you want to do is this, let's say you got a building, it's 10 years, 20 years, get two units ready from, get two units ready. If it's a one bedroom, two bedroom, get two units or one unit ready. Start going to the agencies, Southwest Solutions, uh, Volunteers of America, uh, Disability Network. I did an open house every Friday, and I invited the people to come. And so basically, when I went out, by the end of the time, I already had a backlist of people ready to go. You see, So I never really had to advertise. I just went to these agencies, and I did an open house specifically for these people. So now I had applications. I had everything already available. Mm -hmm. So by the time I finished, I had to pick and choose who I wanted as tenants. So I made sure I got one unit available and I started doing open houses every Friday. Wow. That, and that, that, that's been your, that's your process and how you fill your buildings is you open it with the, the, the open house. And now do you, you call those agencies and say, okay, I've got these open houses on this Friday or says how you do it. Yeah. So basically I got a flyer. And I know all the people by heart now. So basically what I do is I overnight a nice gift basket to them, whatever it is. So like they're on Milwaukee. So you have situations. I send them a nice gift basket. They got donuts. So now they come. When they come, you know, we have a nice catered for them. So pretty much I know when they come, I'm going to get six, seven people first time, six, seven people second time, six, wow. seven people third time. So by the time I'm pretty much ready, I pretty much got it almost filled up. That's awesome. That's awesome. 
Thank you for sharing that. That was enough. Yeah, so that, this is a system we figured out that what happens is we, I, I just looked at it from the same thing as in doing, you know, as selling houses. We did open houses, right? So I said, well, if I do open houses for my tenants, what would that do? You know, I, I, but I'm like, let me do it before I finish. So that way I could have the people already ready. They could be approved, ready to go. And now all I'm doing is calling RPI or calling these guys, tell them come be ready for their inspection. And see, what you're also doing is too, is now in the, you call these people some Southwest and Volunteers of America, they become your salespeople, right? So if they're sitting in front of a vet that's looking for a place to live, they've just toured the property. They have good things to say and plus they're eating your donut. Right. So now they're saying, hey, this is this is a good buck. I've, I've seen the apartment. Right. That's awesome. I mean, that's 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 and awesome. the majority of the people, most of the agents, most of your vets, they know the other vets. Right. Mm -hmm. So they tell them, hey, look, man, you got to come over here because the, I, and most of the places where I had it's five or six vets that know each other that were housed in the same area. They might have came from the same platoon or different areas or whatever, because they're all older. Right. So they tend to know each other, so it works out better. So now it's more of a community. That's why I try to stick to that 20 to 40 units, because 100 unit building, it's hard to get 100 different people in that particular, but a 20 to 40 is still a small enough community where the fact is it's still home, as opposed to this big, you know, monstrous 100 unit building where the fact is now you become a number. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, that's great. Okay, Vern, let's get to your question. we got a couple other people raising their hands. So go ahead, Vern, ask away. All right, thanks a lot. Derek, great information so far. I appreciate that. Uh, no problem. Sharing. I'm glad I joined. Real quick, quick. Uh, at the outset, you talked about the intro to and setting the expectations for your tenants. Um, but my question really is related to owner managed, owner managed versus property owner or property manager. Um, do you manage your own properties? I know you said you had a property management company. Uh, so just wanted to know the pros and cons of owner managed for these 20 units versus property management. And if it was a property management company, how do you facilitate that meet and greet that you talked about? Well, see, the problem you have with that situation, I, I can't really tell you on uh, uh, non, see, I am typically manage my own buildings. So let's say, for example, Pat is the Pat Gage is the management company. It's hard for me to tell him how to do his protocols or what he does in situations. I can offer, I can tell, hey, look, this is how I want to be done, but it's difficult for me to, to parlay that you should do this particular situation um, because this is what works for me. Because everybody got their own set of rules. So me personally, I just always felt like nobody going to care about my money more than me. That makes sense? Yeah. So... I so that's that. the only reason why I don't really do it. I, I never outsourced it. So I really don't know if it worked or don't. I've never outsourced my management because I, I create a unique niche into the situation and the people buy me. You see where I come from? Yeah. Yep, so I get it. When, I, when I start dealing with the, the agencies or whatever it is, you know, they were dealing with me and if they had an issue, they could call me directly. That may not necessarily be right for anybody else, but that just worked for me. And that's how I built it at this point in time. If I scale it to a lot larger, can I still do it? Nobody knows. But as of right now, my relationship is what gets me into the door and what gets me to get the people. And I try to show other people how to do the same thing, but they haven't had the same result. And it, it's for multiple different reasons. One, unit's not there, not ready. Uh, two, the people, you know, they, you know, because what I can say, people got to see how much you, care to some degree before they actually open up so when a lot of time when they go to these agencies they don't get the same response i do i said well first of all i'm feeding them on a regular basis i'm sending them stuff just because so i'm just not going down there always take it you see them coming from i get it, I make it, a I get it. You, I answer make my, you answer my question very clearly and i okay. that, that helps immensely Thank yeah you. so yeah it's hard because you know let's say you deal with a big property management company and you got 20 units and they got a thousand units well, can they really give you that personal attention that you can? That's the only issue you have on dealing with a big man, uh, a decent sized management company. You just one of a thousand units that they manage. Not saying that they want to do a good job, but they can't get that same attention you can give because it's yours. That's why I go back to the sanity old vanity. I'd rather have fewer units that I can manage and run them efficiently and become profitable than to have it where I just got to outsource everything 
and the fact that now I'm going to lose a little bit of control, but also I'm going to lose a little bit of the ability to be able to make those quick decisions that I make now. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Uh, and Concita has a, has a question. Go ahead, Concita. I hope I'm saying that right, right? You can, you have, you can have to come off mute. Yep. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. So my name is Conchetta. Um, How you doing? Good. I'm well. So Derek, so I understand how you're working this. You have a business perspective, but also you really work through influence and you're really your authentic, genuine self. And then in order to get to a lot of these contracts, you're really building those relationships with those key groups by, you know, giving them goods and seeing that you care and what you're offering other people as well. So I understand that per perspective. I have a question about a little bit of a detail. So two things, and it's revolving around costs. So in the beginning of the conversation, we kind of talked about different vendors you would use to fix things. But do you do like thresholds of, of things that the tenant has to take care of? For example, if anything's over 200, I'll take care of it. If stuff is under 200, you'll take care of it. Mine is anything over $125. You'll take care of it. Yeah. Okay. And then do you normally do it's like some people do like, um, give me the receipt and I'll take it off your rent. Or do you actually have someone go there to do it? Or you you'll know, do it. We own a Well, the unique part about, I own a construction company. So we do all <laughs> our, we do our own maintenance and everything. So from, Boiler repair, furnace repair, roof repair. We do everything in-house to some degree. So none of our stuff is really outsourced. Right. For So for a person that doesn't know how to do all that stuff, I don't yeah, know how could, to do everything. Well, no, what I'm saying is on that right there, you you could see the problem. Is, this is what I always say. Having a tenant do it, if it's not done right, they're still going to use that against you to some degree. That okay. Makes sense. So yes. I always believe I would much rather have, I would much rather do it myself Pay, not necessarily myself, but I would rather have somebody that I know that's accredited to do the work. And now what I do is I do a, 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 a verification. I have a letter stating that when the tenant leaves, that they need to sign that, the fact that, that this was done to your satisfaction. So that's where the verification comes from. And so even if you have somebody else do it, the tenant should be able to sign the letter. It could be through DocuSign or whatever it is that they're completed. So that way you could always bring that back up. And that's where the documentation beats conversation that, okay, this was done on this particular date, so they can't use that against you because, like, man, on this date, you signed saying everything was done. Oh, yeah, you're right. All right, great. So I definitely like that point because that's validation of circumstance to show even if you're working with, let's say, a government contract to get yeah. people in or Section 8, it's validating anyone's concern that you haven't repaired something or something along those lines. So that's a yeah, terrific so point. I can also just send that letter to – send that email or that that, that, that that documentation to the caseworker and let them know, hey, look, on this date, she signed and said everything was done. Now, if it was if it was something else, she never sent me any, any additional documentation or sent me any information saying it was different. Now she's just using that as an excuse or whatever not to pay. Okay. Perfect. So I appreciate that point. Now, my second issue revolving around money is mm -hmm. the idea of of the vets. So mm -hmm. you're the, you're the second person who I know who does this, and this is fantastic because I was curious about how to do it. But I appreciate you giving us resources to go to. Now, my question is, just like well, like Section Eight, they pay you on a quarterly basis. Do the tenants that are veterans do you no, get pay, that from? They pay you monthly. They pay you monthly. You don't get paid quarterly. You get paid every month. Yeah. Oh, no, but does it come directly to you, or is it like? I give you every month. I get yeah. direct deposit. Direct deposit. That's my question. Well, so. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and that comes directly from the network. The well, the, it depends. Okay, like okay, it's two different agencies. So like, if it's Volunteers of America, Southwest Solution, um, um, Disability Network, they would send you the money from their agency is through vet it's through the veteran that but then you have rpi which is that's the bash program so even though it may be all bets it's different agencies that send you the money so like bash there is through uh, is similar to section eight on the first through the first and fifth i get a deposit for whatever amount so if i got nine tenants in there and they're paying 80 percent, so i get nine times 80 percent in my account on the first through the fifth or whatever it is Every year, annually, I'm have an inspection that they're going to come back out and do my inspection to make sure that I'm passing my certifications or whatever it is. But I typically get my deposit between the 1st and the 5th of every month. All right, terrific. So that was actually the point that I wanted to know. I wanted to know if it was a direct deposit situation coming from the government assistance yep. as opposed directly from the um, vet. So that's thank well, you for that. Okay. Well, let, let me be clear about that. 
the vast portion is, is the money that comes directly to positive. Volunteers of America, Southwest Solutions, and Disability, they actually mail you a check every month. No, that's fine, but it's coming. Not, it's, you're not waiting for the vet to give you the money out of their pocket. It is coming from somewhere, well, potentially. Well, let me, let, okay, let me probably break it down. Well, remember I was saying every vet, their, their, their income is different, right? So let's say, for yeah. example, I got a vet that makes $2,100. Well, mm -hmm. in that particular situation, you may have a 80-20 mix, right? So let's say, for example, Section 8, I mean, the VASH may pay 80% of the 700. So let's say out of that, 540 might be paid for by the VASH, and then the tenant might be responsible for the 160. Okay, so it can be a similar situation to how Section 8 is, but there is the possibility to get a certain amount of the funding coming from the agency. So yeah, I, majority, I, yeah, most of because I wouldn't even do it if it's vice versa. So let's say, for example, if if the agency is only paying thirty percent, I wouldn't even do it. And the reason why I wouldn't do it because basically they're gonna hold you to the standard of everything, but you're only getting thirty percent of the money. So I, majority of my people are seventy five to eighty percent of the payment from the agencies, if not a hundred percent. Okay. Now, now this is secret. This is secret. I always tell people what I do. In addition to that, is I set everybody on auto pay. Before they sign a lease up, I make them put on auto pay. So whatever the difference is, you it's going to be automatically paid. So I don't have to go out and collect any payments or anything. Okay. So set like up that. auto pay, set up auto pay, and that way on that date between the first, fifth, or whatever date it is, you know, you make it on the third. That auto pay is very important because now it, it, you don't have to spend time trying to collect. All my money pretty much comes in. I, I don't collect any money. I don't have to go out to the places or whatever it is. I don't have to get money orders, anything. Okay. And then my third and final question, which is also revolving around money, is the idea of buying properties that are 10 to 20 units. It could even be five or six. Are you able to ever uh, go to these agencies and say, I'm listen, I'm interested in becoming, um, a, uh, uh, I'm interested in helping the, these um, vets and I'm looking for a property that would suit it. Um, are you able to get any type of special funding to buy properties or do you have to already be set up or will they assist you in finding places to help you help the vets? That's a good question. Never had that asked before. I, I and, and probably Pat tell you, I've been doing this for 25 years, right? So yeah. if it's somebody, in, if it's a building available, I pretty much know about it, you know, from if, if it's something. So I don't really uh, have, and then in, in a unique situation, is I've been able, been decently successful, so I've raised my own private money. So I've never had to see, and I've never went that route to see if it's any funding available or whatever it is. I've, I've never went that route. So I've always done pretty much self-financing or owner financing to some degree. Okay. So that's an open-ended question, but mm -hmm. um, thank you for answering to the best of your ability. So thank you for answering my questions. That's what all, all right. I have for right now. Awesome. Awesome. Hartford, you had uh, your hand up. Yeah. How's everybody doing? Um, okay. Sorry that I'm repeating this question, but I was running through Lowe's trying to get a water hose for Lincoln. Look, I, I've been there. <laughs> so, um, you named Southwest Solutions, Volunteers of America. Network, disability Network. And was there another one? Well, you got Volunteer Disability, Southwest Solutions, and then you actually got RPI. Okay. And I, this is very, I'm glad I, I took the chance because um. You're, 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 I was maybe two months ago, I was trying to get more information on this. I called caseworkers and everything, trying to get information. How well, this is what I'm gonna tell you about that. What happens is this. Hmm. These people get bombarded with all these situations. So it goes back to creating a situation where, you know, it's like you courting somebody to some degree, right? So that's why on a weekly basis, when I first got started, I would send them donuts, I would send them this. So when I went in, I had a warm reception, right? And so it eliminated the hostility of me just coming in after stuff. I gave them something ahead of time. So when I did come in, they were like, okay, you the guy that's been sending me stuff. Hey, look, this is what I'm trying to do. Can you help me out? At that point in time, now it disarmed them where I had already gave them something up front. So now when I went to them, they were open, they, they were open to help me out. Okay, you need to do this, this, and this. Yeah, that, that helps that helps that helps a lot. So that's why I would tell people, you know, it just what happens is this everybody get bombarded, whatever situation. So what I did, I shot a video. Let me be clear, but I shot a video 
I had pictures in Dropbox. So I sent them a link showing you what the units would look like. So when I did go, I had my, all my ammunition. Because what happens is, let's say you go, you don't have anything, right? How can they, how can you really benefit them? Yeah, because I mean, they, I got, just, they got people need, they got people need stuff right then there, right? Yeah, I mean, I was just trying to get general information of who do I even talk to or where to start, so. Well, the thing is this, I can give you all, I can. I, I told Pat, I'm gonna send him a list of everybody you can talk to, but I'm just gonna tell you from my own situation is, you, 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 it, it gotta be a win-win situation. Everybody W can be different, right? So you gotta have something of need to them because you gotta realize these vets on a time clock, right? And what I mean by that is, let's say you stay in a hotel, right? The VA is paying for these guys to stay in a hotel room at eighty dollars a night, right? So for eighty dollars a night for a month, it could cost them probably twenty five hundred dollars. They would much rather put them in your place. So what I say is, that you want to come with a solution to their problem. Their problem is we need to get these people out of their hotel into a place to stay. So if you don't have that, then at that point in time, their patience is kind of slow, low because the fact is they got people, you know, the, the VA, they're high up and saying, hey, we need to get you out of here right in there. So once you get a, a property or a project ready to go, you won't have any problem. And if you need to reach back out to me, whatever, I'll leave my email. i course you through the whole process. But if you don't have that ahead of time, they're not going to be the most amicable people to work with because they got something, they got a need that they got to feel, which is to get the vets out of these, these units because it's cost them $4,800. They'd much rather pay you $900 a month. Exactly. Gotcha. Thanks. Thanks. That's awesome. Yeah, it makes sense. Good. Yeah. yeah, it does. Uh, Doug has his hand up. Go ahead, Doug. Hi, thank you uh, for holding this event. Uh, Derek, I've watched a lot of your videos on YouTube, so thank you very much. You got uh, very good information. Thank Mark Maupin. <laughs> yeah. but, Mark Maupin is the man. Yes. Yeah. I have a very general question. I am more dealing with currently uh, single family homes and I am interested in purchasing an apartment building. What is the overall process look like from start to finish? Do I contact a broker if I find an apartment building I'd like? Do I put in a letter of intent? kind of give me a broad overview of what the overall process looks like. Well, well the and, first thing I do when I'm going to buy a apartment building, I want to see the financials, right? Yep. So once you see the financials at that point in time, because typically, and you know, always tell, you know, just from my conversation, just listen to you, you've already, you, you, you had a financial wherewithal to buy a building. You're not coming in, you know, well, I want to get in this building with no money down. So, once you get that part and you can actually financials and you see that it's a viable building, the next thing you do is I would basically try to get some pre-approval financing available first because that's probably the most because you want to see what you can approve for, right? So if you got a million dollars and you know you want to drop a 1.2 million dollar building, you know you're gonna need probably minimum 25% down. So now you gotta look at can I do seller financing to carry that note, whatever it is. If that's the case. Is the lender okay with doing seller financing? So you want to basically get in touch with a lender and see what kind of approval you have. That way you can see what kind of what kind of funding you technically need. Uh, so like one of my first buildings I bought, it was a uh, eight unit building. Um, now my father, a ten unit building at thirty seven hundred Pasadena. The building was one hundred twenty thousand um, dollars. I didn't have twenty percent down, but the seller was willing to uh, hold a note. The bank paid the bank gave him 75 percent and then the seller held twenty five thousand dollars to you know as a note for six months for six to twelve months and then I paid him off over that period of time refinanced because the building's really worth two hundred thousand I just had to fix it up. Right. So your main thing your first thing would do is figure out what kind of financing you can get available uh for that particular building because it's gonna tell you what your LTV gonna be. Uh and then the age of the building, it changes the loan amounts too. The condition, you know, if it's an A, B, C building, A, B, C, or D building, it changes the availability of your loan amount. So your LTV could be 70%, it could be 75%, it could be 80%. So the first thing I would do, even before I actually do everything else, is try to get the financing available. Okay, very good. 
Thank you. Yeah, that was that was great. That was great information. Yeah, so I would like to add to that as well is and make sure like you talked Derek talked about the areas. Certain areas in town they loan more on or your availability go more on like so if you're an A property, which are you know like the brand new buildings, B's and C's are your workforce housing, and then uh, your D's and below are, are, are really bad areas. So just depend on where you want. It, the easiest place to probably get financing if you're trying to get financing is in your B's and C areas, mm -hmm. where people you know workforce housing. Uh, obviously, you pay a little bit more, but it, it, it's all comparable, right? I mean, it just it just depends. So I would look for that as far as the area, and that will affect uh, how much the bank lends you. Sometimes they'll pull it back if they're not lending in that area to sixty percent loan to value. Then you have to come up with the difference. Okay. Yeah, but you you'd be surprised. A lot of times, you know, what I always do is the older the or the longer the the investor owned the building, the better it is for you because the fact is he has equity built up to the building. A person that bought the building three, four, five years ago. There's not that much equity in there, so the fact is they can't technically do a lot of the sell finance. But most of the, luckily, I bought buildings mostly from people who own the building 10, 15, 20 years. So they've already taken all the depreciation. You know, they may own the building free and clear. So holding a second is not an issue. So I've always done my homework. You know, if you bought the building 20 years ago, you probably paid it off and you don't have no mortgage on there. So now you get situations that be beneficial. So do your homework, see, you know, you know. Is it an older management guy that has it owned it for a while? But if they own it for two, three, four years, you know that there's that much equity in there. So the fact is that you don't have as much ability to do creative financing. Okay. Very good. Thank you. That's I awesome. That is awesome. Goodness, Derek, it, it, uh, it's 8 o'clock. I don't want to stop, but I do have to respect. What I would like to do is, is everybody go ahead and put your contact information in the chat. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'll get that information from Derek. And I'll send out tomorrow uh, an email with the copy of the chat roll, so you'll have everybody's uh, information so you can network, okay? And uh, it, so go ahead and put it in there, and then before I end the call, I'll pull that down and I'll send that on an email tomorrow, uh, and we'll get that information uh, to you. Um, anybody have any questions? I, I want to respect uh, Derek's time as well as everybody else. It is eight o'clock. One last thing, Derek. Did you say thirty-seven zero zero Pasadena? Mm-hmm. Uh, that well, it wasn't. It was actually last year. That was the building I was trying. I was looking at with the HUD HUD vash stuff. So that's kind of funny. But. Yeah, that was ten-unit building. That was actually that's actually I found out about. Uh, I bought that building in nineteen ninety-two. Okay. Yeah. I, now, I, I went back and traced. So I saw. I saw. I probably saw your name on the documents yeah. and everything. It yeah. should have been S and D Enterprises. <laughs> oh yeah. Look, yeah. Yeah. Yep. SD Enterprise. Yeah. So yeah, that I'll one, reach out to you out. later and tell you about the building, what's going on with it. So. <laughs> yeah, because the Bailey, see, I always tell people, you know, success takes time, but it also takes a lot. You know, I say success and failure is a fine line, right? Because you fail more than you succeed. So, how I learned through all this was when I bought 3700 Pasadena, I had to figure it all out because I didn't have nobody like me telling me how to figure it out. So, I had to figure out how to create the expectation. But not being able to satisfy tenants, people turning over, whatever it is, I had to figure it out. And then after a while, I started figuring out, okay, well, if I put this person in, I, I don't have any people. Then I figured out, well, in that building, I had six older people and four younger people. Well, guess what? All my complaints came from the four, from the four younger people. So I slowly got those out. And then I had 10 older people there. No complaints. I want to do this over and over again. I just rinse and repeat. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, obviously, I, I, I'm going to have to ask you to come back because obviously we could probably go for another half hour here. Um, we're definitely going to have you back. I appreciate everybody that came on. Again, one more time, just go ahead and get your information in the chat. Make sure you get your email in there. Uh, and then I'll send out an email t tomorrow morning, probably midday uh, with everybody. Um, and I'll definitely have Derek back. And I, I appreciate everybody coming on. And also join us uh, February 10th is our next next uh, thing we do bi-weekly. Um, I'll have another guest on as well. But I'm going to schedule Derek for another time because he's got a – I'm sure he's got a few more nuggets that he dropped. I, I, I My paper is full with all the nuggets. And I appreciate it, Derek. And thank you very much for spending Anytime. time with me uh, and us, uh, you know, and, and sharing everything. We really appreciate it. So I uh, definitely, folks, uh, thank you. And uh, one thing I would I end with is to tell people: remember, Sandy Old Vandy, 
don't worry about trying to get so many units. Try to figure out what can I do to become very, very profitable. So whether it's doing two single families or doing a multifamily, just try to figure out, okay, am I profitable in each endeavor? Because what happens is everybody in a rush and the only competition you're competing with is yourself. So don't worry about what somebody else is doing. Just worry about what you're doing and then try to figure out from that standpoint because what happens is when you compare yourself to somebody else, it's always going to be an unfair comparison. So just compare yourself to where you want to, where you at now to where you want to go. And, you know, success, you know, it's going to come in incremental movements. You know, I had to do a six unit, then I did an eight unit, then we did a 20 unit, then we did a 40 unit. But in the meantime, I did a lot of single family homes uh, to build cash flow because the one thing I would tell people is multifamily just costs more money. You're buried Very true. by higher. It's a lot more higher, you know, because a single family, you can get in for thirty five to $50,000. You can't do the same thing a lot of times on multifamilies. That's awesome. That's awesome yeah. advice, man. Oh man, I need I need to listen to you more often here, Derek. <laughs> this is awesome. This is awesome. Um, well, I mean, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll definitely have Derek back on because obviously he's got a lot of wisdom. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Thank you for your time this evening, Derek. Thank you. And okay. Look for my the email tomorrow from uh, Pat at Opportunity Creator, and we'll go from them. And thank you, folks. And again, February tenth is our next meeting. Thanks for hosting, Pat. Thank you. Bye bye now. Yep, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Hi folks, Pat Gage again. I hope that you enjoyed what you just saw in the video. And if you want to join these calls, click on the link above my head. It's also in the description of the video and register for these calls. They're every two weeks and we have great content and great speakers come and talk to us about what the industry is and what it's doing and, and how they're finding deals or closing deals. Just a whole myriad of things. Again, it's the Commercial Real Estate Investing Mastermind and it's built for you uh, you know, and, and people just like you wanting to get into commercial real estate or into real estate uh, and get the mastermind effect. Okay, hope you enjoyed. Please click on the link here and in the description and we'll see you on the next call. Thank you much.